85. Channel 85. Channel 85. Channel 85. production, 12 in post-production, and I mean, she's, she's really, really prolific, and she's, she's the independent producer that people go to when they want to get a project off the ground. So um, I cannot be um, more pleased and more honored to be able to introduce to you Christine Bichon. But we talk about everything kind of at the same time because um, we're in such a fascinating time, I think, in terms of film production, content creation, how, you know, every day people moan and groan more that, um, you know, independent film is dead. But if you've been in independent film as long as I have, it's died so many times before. <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, somehow manages to resurrect itself. Um, I want to encourage you guys to jump in, ask questions, make comments. Um, what, the way, what we're going to do is I'm going to you know, talk to you a little bit about what, what Killer's doing, how we're dealing with the present and the future. I'll open it up then. I also have um, a very a, a half hour clip, more like a 20 minute clip that I want to show you guys that I think really will speak to a lot of what we're talking about. Um, and we'll just, you know, take it like that. You know, we will, so we will have a break about halfway through, so, you know, don't worry if you have to smoke or go to the bathroom. Um, but one thing I'm curious about, how many of you guys are here because you want to be directors? And how many of you guys are here because you want to be producers? And how many of you are just here because you want to learn a little bit about film production? Okay, cool. So we can kind of... This, this can move in the directions that you want it to move for, you know, for, you know no question is too stupid. Uh, and, and the only thing I will caution you about questions is don't make them too specific to your project because that can be really boring for everybody else. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, so I'm Christine Vashon. I started a company called Killer Films uh, about 25 years ago. Um, when I started, it was a very interesting time because, uh, and again, this is one of those things where it's like, you know, it'd be great to say this was all planned, but as most things, this is just how it happened. I started out making movies. Uh, my first movie was Poison, directed by Todd Haynes. My second was Swoon, directed by Tom Kalin. And my third, or thereabouts, because at that point I was starting to produce more than one movie at a time, was Go Fish, directed by Rose Trochet. So those three movies, what they had in common was 
they were all films that could be marketed specifically to a gay and lesbian audience. And that was very easy in those days. There wasn't an internet. Uh, you know, you knew you, you just went and put flyers in the bars where gay and lesbian people went. You went to some parades, you went to film festivals that at that time, gay and lesbian film festivals were enormously successful. Uh, and now it seems like every film festival I attend, there's some miserable little panel that's like, is there still a need? <laughs> for gay and lesbian film festivals. <laughs> and I, you know, it's a, it, it's a good question. But the reason I wanted to start talking about this was to lead us into, well, what, you know, what do we do now? How do you aggregate your audience now? And I know that's sort of a big jumping off point, but it's just a discussion I kind of want to inform everything we talk about today, because what we're all dealing with is, you know, how do we figure out how to make the network for us, how to make social media work for us. What kind of movies are we making? Is, is the way people watching their movies now, like the fact that people are watching stuff on their iPads and their iPods, um, is that changing the kind of stories that we're telling? Uh, you know, I know that it's, you know, people make a lot of declarative statements like, I will never, you know, people, it is absolutely abhorrent that somebody would watch Lawrence of Arabia on an iPod. But people are gonna. So, you know, unless we have a cinema police that, you know, <laughs> runs around saying, that's the wrong ratio, uh, we're, we're stuck with the fact that this is how most people are consuming media. And we're not gonna get that genie back in the bottle. So, I, I feel like as, as filmmakers and as film consumers, we have to start figuring out ways to make it work for us. You know, um, the, whole, the whole debate on Twitter and Facebook these days from, from fi a film producer's point of view is, you know, uh, how effective is it really to have a gazillion followers on Twitter? Is that gonna count, is that gonna turn into a gazillion people coming to watch your movie? You know, how many of you guys are on Twitter? And how many of you are on Facebook? Um, so, oh, can I ask you a favor, though? I will be candid about a lot of stuff here, and I don't mind if you post it, but, don't, but if I say anything, if I say <coughs> specifically before I tell you a certain story, um, please don't post that story. Uh, anyway, so back to the whole, the, that whole notion, you know, I work with another film producer named Ted Hope frequently, and he has a blog that I highly recommend you frequent called uh, Truly Free Film. And in it, he's really taken up this notion that, um, that you know, we have to use social media to figure out who our audiences are, and that a filmmaker needs to know who his or her audience is before, you know, before they even start making the film, and that the only way to identify them these days is through social media. And he goes so far as to say, if I have two actors, you know, uh, actor X and actor, y, and actor Y, and they could both do a good job in my movie, but actor X has, you know, 800,000 Twitter followers, and actor, actor Y has 20,000, I'm gonna go with the one with more Twitter followers. You know, I'm not sure that that, you know, again, does that actually translate into more people going to see the film? And one of the things I'm starting to realize that has always made independent film successful from the very beginning, when, when I first started in the 90s and thought we were inventing independent film, which of course had been around, you know, for some time previous, it was always about the authenticity of experience. And independent films, when they really were authentic voices, when they were genuinely uh, voices that could not be manufactured any other way, when they felt truly fresh and original, those were the films that were successful. Um, films that came out, you know, that were made by studios, uh, that at a lesser price where they put B actor in instead of the A plus actor and almost tried to fool audiences into believing that this was an independent film experience. Do you guys remember those movies? 
that people didn't go, because audiences really aren't stupid. They really do recognize an authenticity of experience. Um, those days, also back to what I was saying at the beginning, you know, before the internet, it was very easy for us to identify our audiences, whether it was gay and lesbian, whether it was African American, whether it was Latino. It was very easy for us to make films specifically for those audiences and say, if we just market right to them, then we'll make our money back. And ultimately, you know, that is what we have to keep trying to figure out how to do. So now I think we're at a real crossroads. We were trying to figure out you know, how do, I, how do we identify audiences? How do we use the, you know, the internet and social media to get the word out about what we're doing? Um, how do we make all this work for us instead of being terrified of it? And then I'm sure there's people sitting here going, I just want to make movies. Like, I just, you know, like, what is all this nonsense? I just want to make films. Um, I can stop for a second for any questions or points of discussion if anybody, yes. Oh, uh, uh, Ted Hope's, wet, I think it's truly free film, but if you just Google him, Ted Hope, you'll, you'll find it. You know, he's, he's got, I think he actually has a couple of different blogs, and I might not have given you the name of the latest one. So, you know, but he, but he really, he interrogates those questions a lot and, and in, in, in interesting ways, and he brings in a lot of filmmakers, you know, to debate. Uh, and, you know, it's, um, it's something we're thinking about all the time, you know. Uh, I mean, in the Q&A I did earlier, we were talking about producing itself. And one of the things, absolutely, that, you know, I get asked all the time is, what does a producer do? And in some ways, the response to that question is, what does a, what does a producer have to do now, which is... <laughs> You know, uh, which is so much more than we used to have to do because now we are, I mean, it used to be when I started out, really, I was supposed to make sure that the director didn't screw up too badly, you know, make sure that everything got there on time, you know, make sure that the actors came out of their trailers, make sure that there were sets, costumes, et cetera, in front of a camera when we had to shoot something and make sure at the end of the day that what we had resembled that script that everybody, you know, had decided to put money into. And that was pretty much it. Now we have to do all that, but we have to find the money and we have to um, uh, take care of the movie through its life, through its, uh, you know, life going out into the world and, um, and uh, life, uh, you know, as, as a product um, after it's theatrical, if it even gets a theatrical. I mean, how do you guys watch most movies these days? Are you watching them on, are you watching them theatrically? How often, who goes to the theater once a week here? Once a month? Okay, and who watches most movies that they watch on their computers? You know, I mean, it's just, that's, what a lot of filmmakers are now trying to figure out is how, if that is the way it is, if that is how they are going to um, start get, creating media and people are going to be uh, um, getting media directly from their computers, how can filmmakers sep you know, break, break away the middleman and get their films directly to their audience? which is something, you know, we, we grapple with and discuss all the time. So, but let me back up a little bit and tell you some of the things that Killer is doing right now and why. I mean, for, for years, we, um, we were known for making feature films, and that is still a big part of our business. But a few years ago, we started to realize a couple of things. First of all, you know, the writer's strike happened, which made making movies pretty much impossible for like a year which if that's what your core business is, that can really suck. Uh, and, um, and then pretty much just when we thought we were getting out of that, the, the economy collapsed. And there was a really, again, like a solid year where people were too scared to put money up 
in the kinds of movies the killer is known for. Now, killer is known for movies with auteur directors, uh, you know, um, edgy, often edgy, provocative, original voices. So um, we started looking around, and one of the things that we saw was that a lot of the stories that we had thought were in our provenance as independent filmmakers were actually being told really well and really effectively on television. And that kind of when we weren't looking, television had become less risk averse than the movies. And that there were these TV shows where your protagonist could be an anti-hero. He could die, you know? And women were getting more play on television. Now see, this is something that's always been, since it's a women's festival, it's always been a big thing for us at Killer because, you know, um, uh, women's stories are something that we, that we love. Uh, female protagonists are something that we love. But they're really hard to get financed. Uh, I'm going to tell a story about Far From Heaven that should, you know, just stay in this room, which is uh, Far From Heaven, Julianne Moore was attached, and it was, um, you know, we were putting together the financing, and uh, we were getting a tremendous amount of pressure from the financiers to get a star on the same level as Julianne to play her husband. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know that, well, that's a good part, you know, I mean, it's, it's not the part. But we were going out to, you know, as many movie stars as we could, and Todd's first choice was Russell Crowe. So we went to Russell Crowe, and his agent called me the next day and said, Russell read it, he loves it, he thinks it's one of the best scripts he's ever read. We just have one question. I said, sure. He said, well, it just seems, and I'm sure we're wrong, <laughs> but it just, it just seems like Julianne's the star. <laughs> and I said, yeah, she is. And they were like, uh-huh. OK, well, you know, Russell says if he can play her part, he'll do it. <laughs> so, and that happens all the time. You know, it's just like, um, uh, it's, you know, it, it, the, the marketability or, you know, financeability of female stars with male stars, it's, it's completely out of whack. And the girls will play the wives and the girlfriends and the best friends, but the guys don't want to, you know. And um, and you know the the system as it exists, they don't they don't have to, or at least not as much. So so it's it's become increasingly clear to us that if we want to make a film that's genuinely from a female, you know, with a real female protagonist we have to start looking more and more towards the small screen. So this brings me to, you know, uh, Todd and I made I'm Not There, which was a very, very difficult movie to make. And we can certainly go back and talk about that some more if you guys have specific questions about it. But it was hellacious to finance. It was like, you know, um, it was like shooting five different movies, you know, all these different time periods, all these different movie stars, et cetera. Got it done, got it out into the world. It did, it did respectably. Um, you know, I'm not sure I ever want to hear Bob Dylan's music again, but you know, <laughs> that's fine. There's plenty of people that do. Uh, but at the end of it, usually when we're wrapping up a project, Todd and I will sit down and have the what next conversation. And when we had the what next conversation, I said, you know, maybe you should start thinking about doing something for television. Now, I didn't mean this as, as we say, reverse engineering. I didn't mean take an idea that you tried to get mounted as a movie, and it didn't work. So maybe I can like re-squish it around and bing, OK, now it's ready for TV. Because I find that doesn't work so well for us. But if he could, have come, up, if he could come up with an organic idea, I thought there might really be something to it. He went away, and he thought for a while. And then he came back, and he said, I have the perfect idea. I want to do Mildred Pierce, not the movie, 
that was, you know, a movie that uh, 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 Joan Crawford starred in in 1948 and won an Oscar for. But the book, the book that James M. Cain wrote that's very different from the film, and he said, and it'll be perfect because um, uh, it's domestic. It should be in your living room. Um, and I want the opportunity to spend the time, you know, to do it over several hours, which turned out to be about five and a half hours. Um, you know, I, I want that opportunity. It's perfect. So the first thing we did um, because we knew that in order to get it, you know, to get it, to walk it in the door of some place like HBO, which seemed like the only possible home for it, we would have to go in with our best foot forward, i.e. a Mildred. So we went directly to Todd's dream Mildred, who is Kate Winslet. Now, this to me is completely and utterly a sign of the changing times, because a few years ago, if you had said, Todd Haynes, you know, uh, who's been nominated for Academy Awards, uh, wants to direct a miniseries for HBO, people would say, oh, you're crazy. Why would he do that? And then if he said, and by the way, Kate Winslet coming off her Academy Award wants this to be her next project, it would have been like impossible, you know? It's like that means that's the end of a career when you go to TV. Well, not anymore. So it was really, it was real watershed for us that this all came together the way it did. And at the time, I was completely confident that we would get what we wanted. We shot it this summer, um, you know, over 70 days. We worked with uh, Guy Pierce and James Legro and Mayor Winningham. Remember her? Yeah, she's really great in it. Melissa Leo. Um, and it was really extraordinary. And, you know, we're in the process of cutting it right now. So that was a real lesson about like how do you, if you want to keep telling these stories that aren't necessarily <laughs> fit for the big screen, how do you, or not fit, that's not, that's not right, we'd love for them all to be fit, but don't fit, I guess is what I'm saying. Don't fit in the time that we're in right now. Okay, do you guys have any questions or comments? What was the experience like trying to produce for TV as yeah, opposed to trying? What did HBO do differently? Because I do notice that HBO is really ramping up the quality of the stuff that they do. Well, HBO is essentially a studio. They function very similarly to a studio so that, you know, there's, um, you know, you deal with a studio executive and, uh, and then, like, his or her boss. So it's pretty similar to, to working with, say, a, a Fox Searchlight or a Warner Brothers, except that, HBO is so awards driven because their goal isn't necessarily to, you know, to, I mean, if Warner Brothers is trying to decide, okay, uh, Christine wants us to spend $100,000 on another Rolling Stones song for Boys Don't Cry, is that $100,000 going to mean that that movie's going to get $100,000 worth of more business? Probably not. So you know what, Christine, you don't get it. Um, but HBO is more about we have to make this thing as perfectly crafted as possible because the awards are going to drive the subscribers and drive people to you know pick up the DVDs, uh, play it on demand, etc. That's what it's about. I mean, that's why you know HBO cleans up so well at those you know at the Golden Globes, the Emmys, etc. Yeah. Sounds like what you're kind of getting at are these sort of structural influences on the way you can produce art in, in these different contexts. And I've noticed that Showtime seems to be of all those uh, channels that's doing this kind of post-network television, the really glossy, well-crafted TV. Showtime seems to have the most female-centered narratives. Um, do you think, in your experience, is there a kind of a structural reason that <coughs> Showtime is more willing to do the Nurse Jackies and the Weeds? And the you know, the, your, the structural reason, reason thing is a little above my head. But what I will say is you, what Showtime did was identify a niche. They had to look. I mean, Showtime really, you know, they're in competition with, ooh. Um, they're in competition with HBO. Uh, you know, and usually when we say, we say them in the same breath, right? We say Showtime and HBO. They're both considered like the, 
the high quality premium cable networks. And you know, HBO has been skewing very male with the with the wire and entourage and how to make it in America. It's sorry. And uh, and you know, even the Sopranos and and maybe to a lesser degree, Six Feet Under. So Showtime saw an opportunity that they could really start, you know, appealing more directly to, to female audiences. But you know, all you know, when you pitch something for television, you know, you're kind of pitching to the personality of each network. And I can't pretend I know a ton about it yet because I'm still learning a lot myself. But you know, it's like one network prefers, uh, you know, ambiguous male protagonists, morally ambiguous male protagonists. Another one wants blue skies, that means happy endings. You know, another one, you know, wants some, you know, uh, things, wants procedurals that, that are set in more complicated worlds, you know. Um, when I pitch something to TV, what I've learned to do now is my, the first question to me is, what's the world, you know? And the world is, you know, uh, a Midwestern college where, you know, everybody's in frater fraternities or sororities, and then, you know, these characters appear, and this is what happens. That's how you, you know, that's how you set the stage. Anybody else? So, you know, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a brave new world, and um, and I think television is is simply becoming more and more part of, uh, of how, you know, of, of when a filmmaker thinks of how he or she wants to get their, their story across, that's, you know, that has to become more and more part of, of the, you know, of the palette. Um, and I also think, you know, a lot of you guys, you grew up in like a golden age of TV. I mean, that's the other thing. I didn't. I mean, I grew up with like the Brady Bunch. Not that that wasn't great. <laughs> But it was a different, you know, people at, when I was growing up, television was escapism. It was what you did while you did your homework, you know. Uh, and I think that, you know, a lot of you guys grew up with Six Feet Under, The Sopranos, The Wire, with, where the bar was set so high that when you think about what you're going to do, the bar is set really high. So it's a really, it, it, it's an interesting time for that. Um, I also think, you know, I, f I find like network television is getting stronger as well. And people, you know, everyone's trying to figure out, like, how do we, you know, how do we take these stories, the sto you know, these, these original voices, these provocative voices, how do we take them, to, to, and wh where do we take them, how do we locate our audience in the best possible way? So, um, you know, the other thing also obviously that, we're, that we are grappling with daily is what about, you know, how do we become a film production company, you know, film production company which, you know, has been around forever, how do we adjust and start telling all kinds of stories um, and with all kinds of medium. So one of the things Killer is doing right now is we began an online initiative with a company called Massify.com. You don't need to all write that down because I think we're going to end our online initiative. But you can go on there and take a look at it. Um, and uh, what, what we decided to do was kind of experiment um, with the idea of branded entertainment. Now, have you guys heard about branded entertainment? Are you hearing that term thrown around a lot? So what we wanted to do to sort of put it to, um, you know, put it to good use was we made a deal with a uh, hotel chain called Ace Hotel, which is a boutique hotel chain that has, um, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 hotels across America. And it's kind of hipstery. Um, so what we did was we uh, went to them and said, let's do a co-venture where we do like an online contest where people can submit their ideas. Uh, pitch us movies that have to be five minutes or less, and the only requirement is that they take place in a hotel room. That's it. And we'll, you know, they, they will happen only in your hotel rooms. And we just did it in New York. We could have maybe opened it up to the whole chain, but we didn't. 
So we went through a whole process of filmmakers submitting online their stuff. Um, and uh, we, um, you know, had a, uh, you know, they would, uh, they would pitch their pitch directly to camera. We had people um, who were members of the website, registered members, didn't cost anything, commenting on each other's pitches, commenting on each other's um, uh, um, uh, scripts, and finally narrowed it down from hundreds of submissions to about 10, uh, let people vote on them, et cetera, went through this whole process, and then actually made them. Um, so uh, those movies, and there are um, three of them, are going to premiere on ACE's closed circuit, you know, internal hotel television. And then after that, they come back to us, and we can take them to festivals and do whatever we want. So that was a really cool experience. Um, it really, you know, let us, our filmmakers, uh, got to do whatever they wanted. There was absolutely no content control. Ace was happy because they got these cool movies. Um, and, you know, somebody said to me, but that seems so commercial for Killer to have done. Like, isn't that a sellout? I was like, but where was the lose? It was all win-win. The filmmakers were not filmmakers you usually worked with? Or no, they were people I found online. So it wasn't like there was no nepotism. It, well, I wasn't, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to, like, get this to you because, you know, I know, I, I know who you are already. They peep, everyone went through the same process. Was it fun for you? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I didn't have to wade through the hundreds of of applications. That is what the interns are for. So uh, it was fun for them. Um, what was fun for me was discovering that, uh, that we could actually access a really high quality group this way. You know, because a lot of these websites tend to be genre based. You know, it's a lot of horror geeks. Uh, filming each other, ripping each other up, and posting it. Um, and I'm not putting that down by any means. It's just that I didn't realize that you could move, not, you know, move a little bit outside of that. And there was a whole wealth of filmmakers. And, and I mean, because it kind of comes down to, like, you know, you can make a film on so many things these days. Pr probably 80% of you have something in your pocket right now that you can film on. And it really just has changed the access to, 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 to that kind of storytelling. Um, and it's made it very sophisticated in a lot of ways, you know? YouTube or no YouTube. So when you get those products back and you own them again, would you, would you have them online as a kind of pay-per-view or something? Or? Yeah, we haven't quite figured out yet what we're going to do with these specifically. We are, we're thinking about other initiatives to do, uh, you know, more like, you know, I, I found that making the box as small as possible uh, was really interesting because it meant that people could really experiment creatively in, in more interesting ways. So I, I actually would love to do one where you have to work specific, do, do something specifically on your cell phone. I'd love to do one where it maybe has to take place on an airplane. Uh, I'd love, you know, all, all those things. I think, I think there's, there's a lot of room for real experimentation. So, and we'll see. I mean, you know, I sit down and talk to uh, um, online companies all the time about branded entertainment and content, and everyone's still trying to figure out, you know, what's the best kind of content for the internet? What are people, people going to watch? Uh, you know, there's a growing sense now that, 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 that tiny little attention span that everybody was so panicky about um, is actually expanding a little bit. And uh, that, you know, there's room for longer form media, longer form content. Um, so, you know, who knows? I mean, it's, it's still very much a brave new world. So, uh, yeah. You mentioned producing for like apps for phones, and of course that monitor is going to be so small. What kind of parameters are you looking at to do something that would be for the phone? What, what do you, have you know, I haven't, I haven't come up with it yet. 
I mean, I would probably, what I'd probably do is go to a cell phone company, pitch it to them as something we would do together, i.e. they would pay for, and, um, and uh, you know, figure out, like, you know, is, is the best thing to say, okay, do a two-minute comedy on your phone. I mean, you know, something like that, probably. Yeah. Can you give an example of how, with a feature film, you are combining, like, a feature film that you know you want to make, whether it's in very early development stage or something you've already made, how you do these, like, new outreach platforms, whether it's brand entertainment or partnering with NGOs or partnering with a cell phone company. Like, how can you combine those things? How can you combine those things for a feature film? I honestly don't really know the answer. I know we're all, you know, we're all kind of, um, struggling to, to discover exactly what the, the right magic combination is. I mean, maybe what I should do is step back a little bit and talk a little bit about film financing. Because film financing, these movies are still getting financed. And, you know, they're still getting financed a certain way. And that will at least illustrate what the weaknesses and the strengths of that are. And then we can talk a little bit more about your question, which is a good one. I mean, when I first started out, we financed movies, independent films were pretty much financed by a combination of a limited partnership, which was investors putting up money. Uh, limited meant they couldn't lose more than they put in. And it also meant that they um, couldn't tell you what to do. And it frequently meant that they had the same last name as the director. <laughs> um, uh, there were more grants around in that time. There were also um, companies, uh, television companies specifically in Europe, who were uh, financing, you know, uh, um, uh, the independent film out, you know, with like television pre sales. And a lot of filmmakers, you'd be surprised, Hal Hartley's movies were financed that way, Todd Haynes's first couple ones after Poison. I mean, we really leaned heavily on that European money. Uh, which was very generously made available to, um, to American filmmakers because there really was a perception that we didn't, you know, we had no subsidies, we had nothing, we had nothing else, you know. Um, there was a company, however, that existed then called American Playhouse that um, had a sort of, you know, initiative to, uh, to finance movies in whole or in part that, <coughs> you know, had a uh, commercial and artistic value. Um, I'm trying to think some movies. Swoon was financed in part by American Playhouse. If you guys know some other titles, shout them out. I know Longtime Companion was. You know, does anybody remember any others or you're all too young? Okay. Anyway, but that was the kind of thing American Playhouse did. And that was like, uh, and uh, American Playhouse was very WNET. Okay. So, that's how we started out. Then what evolved for us was our film started having, and this was again before, um, you know, before we knew that there were other rights besides theatrical that we could sell for our films. Because um, those rights didn't quite exist yet. So, um, so we were selling uh, our films abroad and a lot of, you know, American independent films had worth abroad, you know, so that we could sell France for and get, you know, a chunk of change, sell England, Spain, etc. What this kind of evolved into for us is we began financing our movies with a combination of equity financing, foreign sales financing, <clears throat> and often a North American distributor already in place. So in the 90s, when, when, you know, independent films were getting financed at a certain level that they're not getting financed at anymore, we would usually take two of those things. What we do now still, I mean, foreign sales-based financing basically means you get a sales agent, and that sales agent says, okay, this movie, I'm just making up these actors' names, okay? I mean, I'm going to use real actors' names, but don't put any credence to what I'm saying about their worth in the foreign marketplace. But really, what it's about is, do you have an actor that means anything foreign? It's almost like you're saying, if I got one Christian Bale and one Tony Collette, what's my movie worth? You know? 
how about if I have a Christian Bale and, you know, a, a Tom Hanks and an Al Pacino, can I cast an unknown girl? It's like these are the constant discussions that we have. And <clears throat> this was how these movies were financed for ages. And we would build in the foreign component. And if, if the foreign component was strong enough, we could finance completely out of, uh, out, out of uh, the foreign market. And then what we had left, to, what, you know, what we could sell was North America, which at that point was always at least 30% of your total budget. Now, what happened when the economy collapsed is foreign sales financing, foreign sales-based financing collapsed too, for a lot of reasons. Part of it was that, you know, uh, there, there were certain subsidies in European countries that helped uh, these foreign distributors put up the kind of money they were putting up. There were television output deals that went away. You know, a television output deal means that no matter what my movie is, you know, uh, HBO Spain is going to is going to um, pay two hundred thousand dollars for it, no problem. So I have that two hundred thousand dollars to invest in your movie. All of those things started to go away. So that has left us all kind of, you know, panicking. And then another big thing went away, which is no one knows what North America is worth anymore. Okay? And that is a big <laughs> problem. It's like, how do you be, how can you be a producer and figure out what the budget of your movie can be, uh, should be when no one can tell you what anything's worth? I mean, it's, it's a real, it's a real issue. So um, how did that manifest itself? Well, let's see. The first, uh, the first market after the economy collapsed was really that, that Sundance where, you know, pretty much nobody bought anything. And everybody, you know, was sitting, there was lots of dire predictions and people saying, you know, well, and a lot of like, well, filmmakers, this should show them that they shouldn't be making movies that are so fill in the blank, you know, dark, personal, you know, uh, with no stars. But even the movies with stars weren't selling. Then, you know, movies went to the Berlin market. You know, every year there's, there's, a, bu there's a bunch of different film markets that are really bellwethers. There's Berlin, there's Cannes. Uh, there's Toronto, which isn't like a market market, but a lot of things are bought and sold. And, um, and then there's the American film market. So at, you know, at these things, you get, you know, we get these phone calls, there's a Natalie Portman movie and no one's buying it! You know, like, <laughs> people were hysterical, like, because everything, it, it's as if, you know, you, you said to people, like, everything you thought you, you were, was the foundation that you built upon, we just took it all away. We just told you, you know what? Tomorrow, eggs could cost $1,000 or they could cost $2. We don't know, you know? So how do you know if you're going to have eggs for dinner the next day? You know, it's, it's, really what, it's really what happened to us. So now it's stabilized to some degree, but the things that we've really come out of it with Oh, so North America. Yeah, so you remember, you guys have read all those stories about bidding wars at Sundance and Miramax sitting in one room and searchlights sitting in the other and, you know, somebody like John Sloss running in between them going, they went up to five, they went up to six, they went up to seven. And the filmmaker going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm buying a condo, you know. <laughs> I mean, those days are really over because now, you know, because of the, the, you know, de because of the shortened w theatrical windows, because of the fact that, you know, movies don't get to sit in theaters for, you know, all these different reasons. North America has become a real, you know, how do you figure out what it's worth, you know, in this day and age? How do you figure it out? So now we have to craft budgets where we don't assume we're going to sell a whole bunch, we're going to sell North America for a whole bunch of money. And, um, and we ha when we work with foreign sales agents, um, we have to be really specific and careful about what will work in what marketplace. Um, and we have a lot of talks about that, you know? 
Uh, all right, uh, let me go back and say, this was just our experience. We took two movies to Toronto, okay? Both were first-time filmmakers. Um, one was a comedy uh, with first-time, as I said, first-time director named Abe Sylvia. It was called Dirty Girl. It took place in 1981. Uh, it was about um, uh, the school slut and her relationship <coughs> with a fat gay boy. Uh, who was an unknown actor named Jeremy Dozier. The school slut was played by an up-and-coming actress named Juno Temple. And then we peopled the rest of the movie with people like Mary Steenburgen and Bill Macy and Dwight Yoakam. Um, I know, a weird movie for him to appear in, but he's really good. Uh, we had had a big battle with financiers about keeping the movie set in the 80s because uh, they were afraid that would make the film cost too much. Although, our, you know, we, it took place in Oklahoma where we shot it in Los Angeles, which I'm not sure has changed much since then anyway. But, um, but we also argued that it being in the 80s allowed us to bring a musical element in, which I think helped, you know, uh, kind of drive the comedy and the et cetera. So that was one movie. The other movie that we took to Toronto was called What's Wrong with Virginia? and it was Lance Black's directorial debut. Uh, Lance Black had just won an Oscar for writing the screenplay of Milk. Um, the movie was, uh, was also very personal. Abe's movie was very personal, but Lance's movie was also extremely personal, but not a comedy. Uh, really, you know, t uh, personal, tragic, not like a total bummer, but definitely a movie that you know, caused you to, to think and to, and to feel. It's had a fantastic lead performance by Jennifer Connelly, um, a uh, young uh, actor named Harrison Gilbertson, who's been in hardly anything but was terrific in it, and Ed Harris and um, uh, Amy Madigan. Okay, so I bring these two movies to Toronto, and they both had very opposite experiences. Uh, both were made for about the same amount of money. Um, now, Abe's movie, you know, uh, kind of went in under the radar. We tried desperately to get the actors to come. None of them could, except, of course, for Jeremy. Um, and uh, uh, we finally ended up showing in sort of a smaller venue. We got a lot of the, um, you know, a, a lot of the acquisitions people came, but there was another screening that same night uh, I think of a film called Submarine, and so most of the heavy-hitting acquisitions people were over there. Our movie starts, and it's such a feel-good, funny musical. It's all Melissa Manchester. I know you all are fans. And, um, and halfway through the movie, it was like we suddenly went back 10 years. We get yanked out of the screening by Har Harvey Weinstein, who wasn't there himself, his henchman, and they say, we want to buy the movie before it's over. Oh, that's awesome. So we did. And we sold it to them for three million bucks for North America and English, a lot of English speaking territories like the UK, I think, and France too. So they got, you know, that's a lot of money, and, but it also, they got some nice territories. Um, so that was pretty much about what the movie cost. So all the investors got their money back. No, the, the creators didn't get a whole lot back, you know. But what was great about it was it was like, phew, I guess if you make it for the right amount of money and, you, uh, and, and it's a certain kind of movie and you really have a, a sense of, of this, you know, of, of, of who your audience is, et cetera, it can make sense. So that was, that was great. And I think it was a nice, it was nice for the festival in general because it made everybody go, okay, this can, you know, this can happen. And pretty much, you know, uh, that same day, uh, Ted Hope's movie, Super, which bears no resemblance to Dirty Girl except that it is also a comedy, a, a, a first-time director, um, some interesting talent like Rain Wilson and Ellen Page. He had a pretty much the identical experience. Sold the movie very quickly for just about what it had cost. Yeah? So then do you maintain DVD rights or like 
No. We have foreign rights. And f we have, uh, there's a lot of territories that we still haven't sold on Dirty Girl um, that will be profit. But I think that there's a sense, I mean, now there's a whole debate about what, you know, does American comedy translate abroad? You know, so, uh, so in some ways, what will happen is, I think with Dirty Girl is, we'll have to wait till the Weinstein Co. takes it out. And presumably, it'll be as successful as we hope it will be. And then that will drive some, some other foreign territories. Yeah? So you sold it for a certain length of time then? You license it for 12, 15, 20 years, depending on, on what your Profit. I mean, you've kind of sold it at what it costs to make. Yeah, I mean, profit comes, you say, from other markets. That you'll yes, sell. but I mean, you have to understand. Well, first of all, the, it depends where you are in the as an investor. There are some investors who come in and say, "I'm investing the last 25 percent, but I want my money to come out first with a 10 percent premium." You know, that's my business. Or I want it to come out with 15 percent premium. I mean, so there's all kinds of there's all different kinds of investment. Two questions I think are related. How, how in the world did you get that script to Russell Crowe? I mean, just physically, how did it happen? Oh, how do we get a script? We, the way we get a script to any actor is usually through their agent. You know, and that's, um, and actually that, well, do you want to ask your second question? Well, my second question is about budgets, because I'm a screenwriter, too, and when I approach production companies, now they ask me two things. They say, who's in it? And I go, I, 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 that's why I'm calling you, you know, right. to help me line up people who are in it. Right. And the next question they say is, what's the budget? And I, I always want to say, well, it depends on who's in it, right? You know? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's something that you have to do now, or you, that your producer has to do, which is you have to package your movie, OK? And, um, and what packaging means is, putting together the actors and all the talent that are going to bring it from the script to the screen. Now, you know, how do you get Russell Crowe to read your script? I mean, that's, it helps if you're Todd Haynes. And if you're not, then what you have to do is, is go through an actor's agent. If you have another way to an actor, if your brother went to school with his best friend, if, uh, if you know his hairdresser, all of those things, fair use, go, you know, use them. There's some people who would sit up here who do exactly what I do, who would say, I never use the fucking agents, they're assholes, etc. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it can feel like agents are not part of the solution, they're part of the problem. That said, if a script is truly great and it's a really great part, I really feel like it, it works its way eventually to people that can help you. All right, but rule number one in, in, try, in dealing with agencies or with any film company, don't start at the top. Because, you know, it's like if you guys call me to pitch your film to me, I'm not going to return your call. I don't know who you are. I'm too busy. It's, I, I mean, it's just, it's not going to happen. But I have people who work for me. Every agency has people in their agency whose job it is specifically to look out for people who are starting out and to, and to not miss a cool project and not miss a cool script. So those are the people to cultivate. Those are also the people who are going to be running the companies at some point. I mean, that's how it, that's how it goes. All the people I started out with are now, you know, I, I now have relationships with, you know, the James Seamuses and the Bob Burnies because when I started making movies, they were you know, the second, third, fourth underlings at the companies they were working at. And now they're not. You know, now they're running them. So that's, a way, you know, that's one way to start at least working your way into uh, getting, getting you know, your, your material to talent. Um, technically, an agent is supposed to show every single offer to an actor. Um, it helps if an offer ha is backed by money. Like if you can say that this is, you know, this movie is financed. This is the conundrum. You know, a movie. Uh, you aren't going to get your financing till you get your actor, but your actor doesn't want to 
be on the movie until you have your financing. So what do you do? You know, you have to kind of, you know, juggle and spin. And I just, you know, I had a situation not so long ago, and again, I'm just making up these names. But now, because foreign sales have become so stagnant, actors have gotten really scared about getting attached to movies that you're trying to finance on their name uh, that you don't get financed. Because no actor wants to be known as like, Oh yeah, they went out with that movie with you know uh, uh, Ewan McGregor attached, but nobody wanted to make it. Then that's like it's almost like they have a black back, uh, black mark against them when they didn't even make the movie. So I've been in situations lately where an agent will call me up and say, "Okay, I showed the script uh, to Al Pacino. He loved it. He wants to do it, but you can't say he's attached." And I'll say, "Okay, but so one of my I, I don't get what I'm supposed to do. Well, he's going to do it, but just don't tell anyone he's attached. <laughs> you know? So it's just, you know, it's just becoming like a whole new world of, you know, trying to navigate these, um, you know, these, this, uh, uh, how, how things get bought and sold and what's worth what. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about Virginia, and then I'm going to show you then maybe what we'll do is take a break, and then I'm going to show you a, this 20-minute clip, which I think will be really interesting. Um, but uh, uh, Virginia also showed at Toronto. Uh, the stars all came, um, and red carpet, et cetera. And the movie did not have the same experience. I think there were two reasons. One is, you know, uh, there's nothing like putting a comedy in front of a film festival crowd. They just, you know, it just, it's like, it's fantastic. They really, I mean, people go to film festivals to like movies. It's not quite the same as, you know, when people are going to their local cineplex. Um, you know, when you're at a film festival, that's the whole thing. It's festive. You know, you're giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. Filmmaker is there, often their parents are there too. You know, you want to have a good time. So if the movie is funny on top of that, you know, like break out the champagne. So Virginia, because it was more difficult, I think, that, you know, it did not, the audience was with it, but it wasn't the same sort of, you know, big, big response. The other thing was, I think, that because Lance had had the temerity to write a, a feature film and win an Oscar on his first script, people had their knives out a little bit. And that was very, very tough. Um, and CAA, who was representing the movie, uh, told us, we always knew that this movie would not sell right away. Like it has to sort of germinate and percolate a little bit and uh, give it a little time and the distributors will come to it um, which is, uh, you know, eventually starting to happen now. The festival was over mid-September. We now, we have two offers on the table. And another offer that we're thinking about that gives us, I mean, the two offers we have on the table are sort of standard theatrical uh, for not a whole, not a very big license fee. There's another offer we're considering that would allow us to be more directly in the revenue stream, you know, uh, and would not be as much money up front or any money up front, but would allow us to really specifically control video on demand, which you know um, is becoming more and more something that you know filmmakers are thinking about in terms of reaching their audience directly. IFC obviously has been doing this very successfully—a combination of theatrical and video on demand. But you know, IFC takes very long license periods—20 years, 20 years. You know, I'm not putting IFC down. We wouldn't have half the great movies that we get here if it wasn't for them. But, you know, they definitely are seizing an opportunity in the last 15% type. So, so I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to show you. Then I think um, uh, we should take, before I show it to you, we should take a bathroom break because I need one. Um, but what I'm going to show you is, is uh, have, have any of you heard of the Neistat brothers? Yeah. 
Yeah, one, one or two people. OK. This show is something that um, I was approached a few years ago by uh, these two brothers who lived and worked in downtown New York who were making probably the thing they were best known for at that time was when the iPods first came out, they discovered that the battery was, was uh, fixed to run out after um, a, a certain period of time and couldn't be replaced. So they made a, vid a, a video called Apple's Dirty Little Secret. And it went viral, and everybody in the world saw it. So you probably did, even if you didn't remember, if, even if you don't remember. But they were, you know, they had been working on this kind of homemade, but sort of homemade but totally forward-thinking show at the same time that they just wanted, they wanted to, to sell to television. And I helped them craft a pilot. And with their producer, Tom Scott, I took it around and sold it to HBO, which is a very short version of what happened over two years. Um, HBO aired it, not with a whole lot of fanfare, so I, most people didn't get a chance to see it. Um, and it's maybe not the right place for it. But this show, to me, in a lot of ways, is, it's a very inspiring about the way it tells stories. And you know, the guys want, are thinking about doing the second season in something much more web-based. And I just feel like it's something that culmin like brings together a lot of the things we were talking about, about how, you how do we tell stories now, what kind of stories do we tell, what kind of medium do we use, et cetera. So let's, um, let's see. Let's, let's take a 10-minute break and then come back here and watch this, if that's cool with you guys. You guys have an idea why I showed that to you, right? Any comments about it? or? Questions? Yeah? It was very entertaining because it was very original. Mm -hmm. And that was what it was all about, originality. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, those guys made it with, like, you know, the stuff we have in our pockets, basically. You know? And, look, if they didn't have a good sense of storytelling, it wouldn't, you know, it would just be like, it would be a snooze. But they did. And I think it's very inspiring because it really, I think this is something that will lend itself to the web, that will lend itself to all different ways. You know, it's, it's almost like something, a way of storytelling that can be reworked for all different kinds of mediums. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, my question, my follow up then to that is does <coughs> originality trump stars, money, et cetera? Well, I mean, that is a good question. Because in some ways, you know, one of the things that's always interesting about the, you know, a movie that will like kind of bolt out of Sundance out of nowhere uh, is often it is the ones that are truly original and authentic voices, like Napoleon Dynamite. You know, I mean, Napoleon Dynamite, every now and then something happens. Uh, before a film festival, which is pretty horrible, which is, you know, what you're trying really hard to do is make sure that no one gets to see your movie until the night of its premiere. But especially nowadays where, you know, everything's done on DVD, uh, DVDs circulate, and a lot of acquisitions people will try and, um, you know, get a hold of them so that they don't have to go see 20 movies in three days. Maybe they just have to see 15. So Napoleon Dynamite, the DVD, got out. And the word on it was like, oh, it's a nothing. And then it screened in front of that audience. And it was just like clearly speaking a language that these acquisitions folks just hadn't quite you know, fi figured on. And that movie went off to make a gazillion dollars. And I, I watched it recently with my daughter again. I hadn't seen it since Sundance. And whether you like it or not, it is truly an original voice. So yeah, I think originality ultimately can trump stars. The thing is, stars are such an insurance policy that it's really, I mean, that's where it starts getting tricky. Like, you know, uh, neither Dirty Girl or What's Wrong with Virginia would have gotten made if they hadn't had some level of star. 
unless the director had, directors had reconceived them completely to make like this. But I'm not sure that those tales would have lent themselves in quite the same way. So yeah, you had a question back there. I'm just curious about, it was interesting to me how it was very stream of consciousness, it was a story within a story. Right. It, was, it, was, it was like I'd talk to you and go, oh, but you know what, there was this, oh, that's no, right. And just like that. And right. do you think it's almost like a, a style in itself? Absolutely. Do you think that's, that's really what people are looking for now? I mean, it, it is original, but it's also not in a way. Well, I think when, when I try and describe it, I kind of describe it as like, it's almost the way we're talking to each other because we have so much media at our fingertips anyway. So, you know, I'm on the phone saying, hey, I just saw this t-shirt I want to buy. Here, hang on, I'm taking a picture, just sent it to you. What do you think? Oh, hey, I just got the video of our daughter, you know, performing in this year's beauty pet. You know, it's like, that's how we're speaking to each other. and in interacting with each other. And it's kind of like what the nice dads do is just take that and make it into art. Yeah. Going along with what she said, uh, it is very, it's almost scattered. Mm -hmm. e easy to follow, at least for myself, and very entertaining. Did you find that any of just the popular audience had a hard time like keeping up with it? or? No, I mean, you know, its audience thus far, it showed for eight consecutive Fridays at midnight on HBO in June. It has developed a strong sort of web, you know, fan base. So we're thinking about where to take it next because HBO doesn't want to do a second season. But I think that has less to, I mean, it, to be absolutely candid, what happened with HBO is there was this extraordinary woman who used to run the creative side named Carolyn Strauss, who was really responsible for The Sopranos and a lot of the shows that you have seen and loved. Um, she bought the show. Two weeks later, out on her ass. So not because of the show. Uh, um, and now she produces True Blood for them. So it's not like she's, you know, uh, sorry, this thing, this thing is irritating me. Can I um, move it around a little bit? Um, Anyway, uh, so for that reason, it kind, of, it kind of didn't have a champion there. And I think that, you know, HBO, like any place, it, it, they have like some shows that, that succeed because they're pushed internally and some that aren't. And this one wasn't particularly pushed internally, I don't believe. But it doesn't matter. They took a, they took a flyer on it, they showed it, and that was great. Um, and, uh, uh, it built an audience, and now we have to decide where we're going to take it. Um, I have a question. When you said that um, it premiered June on, how recent was this film? Not, um, oh, it was filmed two years previously. brothers want to go out with a theatrical piece or? No, no. In fact, that didn't even occur to them. They wanted it to go on to television. At two, you know, two years ago when they first started putting this together. Now, I think they're more interested in continuing it in some sort of web-based format. Yeah. Is there an HBO portal yet to where they would do web programming? Um, I th I th you mean besides just the, the on-demand stuff, I don't know. You know, I'm sure they're working on something. Yeah, totally. Also, because um, like they said that they maxed out their credit cards to like, buy a lot of their equipment, do you think that they made back a lot of the money that they spent? I mean, like they renovated, they took, they took the key, like, I know what they made back, and they okay. did just fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> They're not starving. Not quite. Yeah. The danger is, of course, is that people say, oh, look, that was simple, that was easy, cheap, let's cheap, let's do it, and it won't be the same. Because well, of course, but, but that's the same with anything. I mean, you know, look, all we do in movies is imitate what other people have done. And anytime somebody, you know, uh, manages to forge a true innovation, of course it, you know, I mean, I always say um, there's, you know, there's certain movies that you see now that seem derivative, but they're not derivative, they're just what was derived from. You know what I mean? Like, like that movie, um, Tim Hunter's movie, River's Edge, which is a terrific movie, 
But when you see it now, it feels like something you've seen before. But that's because you have seen it before ever since. You know? So that, look, if this movie can inspire a thousand people to say, hey, I can do that, you know, or this TV show, I should say, I can do that. Let me try and do something. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and out of those thousand, three are good. Isn't that pretty good? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you back there. Yeah, I was just wondering, did they have a, a day job? Or how are they? Yeah, how they, su all they supported so. themselves by, um, uh, you know, by doing commercials and, and um, stuff like that. They had jobs. For, you'll see in later episodes, they had, um, uh, uh, they were working as artist's assistants to an artist who's, sorry, I'm having a senior moment, an, a famous artist whose name is completely out of my head. Uh, so, um, so they, you know, they did stuff like that. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about the outlets for these, these films, these short films, even, even, even longer films, um, we, you know, the outlets for them, there are, uh, we talk about web-based um, places, you know, things can be shown in a theater, things can be shown on the website. What, what's, your, what's your opinion about these outlets and where they, you know, because you, you can't make much revenue from a website. You know, people have... Um, well, not yet. Or I mean, that's the, I think what, what, what everyone's circling around is how do you make money uh, you know, selling your stuff directly to the web, you know? Um, and I think that, I mean, look, just see the evolution of the web already in terms of how you, how you even gain access to it. It used to be, you know, you just turned on your computer and you just found it. And now, you know, you can't really do that anymore. You know, now it's like, uh, you know, it's all protected and you either have to pay to access it or you have to have, you know, uh, a passcode or what have you. Um, in Europe, now it's to the point you, you have to, to pre-buy cards, like phone cards. And those cards access, you know, they, they uh, tell you what site to go to and you scrape off, you know, the number and that number, you know, regulates how much use time you have. You know, so... In Europe, yeah. I mean, if, if I wanted to go on the web, I had to buy the stupid card. I wasn't happy about it, you know. It wasn't cheap either, you know. But so we figured out that we seem to have figured out, you know, for the layman, you know, how, that you got to pay to access the web. So I think that it's we will soon f have a methodology of how you, you know, how you download, you know. The, look, Netflix already is in the process of this whole, like, you know, when you want it, press the button. Like, that's what it's all about. And, and I think that the real question is, is that are you, as a filmmaker, are you going to be using Netflix to get your work out there or IFCs on demand, and I'm sure they'll have a portal soon? Or are you going to start just doing it yourself? Is that where the money's going to be? Um, like, uh, for example, Todd Solondz's um, Palindrome. Mm -hmm. I saw that on Netflix. I was wondering, like, I haven't seen that movie anywhere else. I mean, aside from blockbusters, like, not really, I mean, they're, like, closing down. Right. Does Netflix help uh, the film industry, or how do you see? Oh, I think it helps. I mean, it also, Netflix is a wonderful place to aggregate an audience. I mean, that's the other thing is, you know, as I'm sure all of you users know, that if you start renting art films from them, they start suggesting more and more art films to you, and they're building up this huge base of like, this group of people is gonna watch a Todd Solon's movie, you know? And, um, and that's great. I mean, I think, I think Netflix has been true pioneers, you know? And it's like, so something like palindromes, you know, it used to be, okay, you'd catch it theatrically, but chances are it probably didn't come to Columbia, Missouri, right? Unless you have some art house theater I'm unaware of. Um, so if you didn't get to catch it theatrically, you would either have to wait till it came on demand and watch it that way on maybe the IFC channel or the Sundance channel or something like that, um, or you'd buy the DVD. 
um, or rent the DVD. And now that's becoming harder and harder to do because there's, you know, that, that market is basically being kicked to the curb. Um, so now, yeah, maybe it will only be available on Netflix. You know, or you could, of course, buy a pirated copy. But that's, you know, you can't do that. Yeah? You know, I, I can't really answer that question because it's usually a license that's made by the distributor. I don't deal with Netflix directly, but perhaps at some point I will be, and then I could answer that question. You know, um, I, when I sell a movie to Fox Searchlight or, or Weinstein Co. Or, or Magnolia, those are rights that they hold on to. Now, more and more these days, filmmakers are starting to try to like split up their rights so that they can say, OK, I'll let you have the theatrical. I'll let you have the video on demand. I want the streaming. You know, so there's, there's just more and more ways to skin those cats. And I think at some point what will happen, I believe, and I could be wrong, I feel like there will be some kind of, of site, some kind of community-based site that maybe filmmakers put together themselves where they can, you know, that basically for a small, a small fee or a small percentage that goes into maintaining the site, you can start presenting your work directly to the audience for pay, and that money will just come back directly to you. You know, I think what's daunting most filmmakers these days is they don't want to have to build a site. Um, we figured out, before we did one of these workshops, because sometimes Ted and I do them together, we actually called somebody up to find out how much it would cost to build a site where we could just offer our, our work. And I think it was about $50,000 was the answer we got, which seems incredibly daunting if you're making like a $50,000 movie. But what if there were a whole bunch of you you know, and then why, why are you letting those revenues go to Netflix and IFC? Someone's going to figure that out, and, um, and there will become a brand that you go to, you know, so that it's not just some fly-by-night, you know, and that will then, I think, help filmmakers, you know, uh, answer that question, the eternal question, how the <laughs> fuck do I make a living at this? You know? Yeah? On the other end of that, which is similar, Right. And all that. You know, I I don't I I haven't done a whole lot of it. Somebody was asking me outside if I'd done any crowdsourcing, and I haven't. Um, you know, I was talking to John Sloss uh, about one of his clients, Kevin Smith, and John Sloss was like, you know, Kevin should just have his insane number of fans all pre-buy his next DVD for ten bucks. And he'd have all the money he needs to make his next movie, you know. Um, and he hasn't, I mean, there are some of these websites, I guess like Kickstarter and stuff, which are kind of like, please put money into my movie because I'm a nice person. Yeah, I'm not into that. I'm like, we're all nice people, you know. Um, yeah, I, I find that a little repellent simply because I just, you know, I, I look, I believe film is a commercial art form, and that is part of its charm and frustration and and that you know what makes what makes the American film industry different from any other film industry in the world is we have no subsidies. We live and die on the audience. That's what it's about. And I believe that makes for more interesting filmmaking. In my opinion, feel free to disagree with me, and that's fine. But in my opinion, that is what that it's that where those those two meet and where you gotta figure it out. You know, in some ways it's like it's amazing that you can make a movie like Happiness that is actually profitable and it just makes you think like that's how did we figure that out? That's fantastic, you know? And that's the a lot of the joy I get out of it. Now, what we do have instead of subsidies though in America now is rebate states. It's just we're always chasing those around because, 
you know, we find ourselves like, we're going to shoot Michigan. Oops, they ran out of money. So we're going to Georgia. Okay, now we're going back to New Mexico. You know, so that definitely has its own, uh, you know, set of pluses and minuses. Yeah. Um, kind of a different tack. Um, this, I'm, I'm thinking of Virginia, uh, particularly now. Will that, if you do a foreign sales, will that drive? Uh, domestic sales? Foreign domestic? sales do not dra drive domestic. It's only the other way around. In other words, we as Americans don't give a shit what happens anywhere else. We only care about what happens here. So saying to somebody, well, think about it. Like if I said to you, come see my movie. It was really big in France. You'd be like, uh-huh, so is Jerry Lewis. So, you know. Question then, which is so? Are you looking for foreign sales agents or just domestic sales agents? So well, can you talk about that the whole world about agency? the whole sales agency thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, foreign sales agents are are specific companies that um, and they have libraries of movies that they handle the foreign rights on, and they don't just handle the sale of the rights; they uh, service the deals too. In other wor words, you know. It's not enough to just say, okay, France, you have the rights to the new Todd Haynes film. You know, or you have the rights to Far From Heaven. Somebody has to actually physically deliver all the stuff that that company needs in order to exploit it. The trailers, the, the print, the posters, all, you know, all of that. Um, uh, subtitled, exactly. So, um, so that's, you know, it's, it's a big, it's a service job, not just a selling job. Um, so there's a lot of different sales agencies and they kind of have different personalities the way distributors do. Uh, there's a company called Fortissimo, for example, that um, when they first started out, they took a chance on a young Asian filmmaker named Wong Kar Wai. And, you know, his movies have sort of defined that company. But they also sold Mysterious Skin Greg Araki's film, and they sold palindromes. So they sell, you know, sort of high-end art house uh, Asian cinema, but also really interesting, you know, edgy independent cinema, American independent cinema too. Um, you know, then there's like Summit, which is now known mo mostly for um, Twilight. Twilight. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but before that, Summit, was sort of like a higher end um, you know, uh, sales agency that really took movies that had bankable stars. Um, uh, then there was a company uh, called Celluloid Dreams that, that was very director driven. They did uh, a Todd Haynes film. They were trying to do people like Almodovar. Like they, they wanted to be known as the director's company. So they all have their own kind of flavor. They have to have relationships with banks because a lot of what a foreign sales agent does is you give them your script and they and your cast and they look at it and they give you what's called estimates and that means they give you a list that says I believe that I can sell France for 500,000, Italy for 600,000, Spain for 200,000, it's on and on and that list adds up to a number and that number is what a bank will lend against for you to make your movie with. See, now if a foreign sales agent puts together a list of estimates and then doesn't get them, that's bad. That's bad for a lot of reasons. But it also means that the bank is not going to lend. The bank is going to say, you know what, we don't trust Celluloid Dreams anymore. We don't trust Fortissimo, Fortissimo anymore. We lent money against those estimates and we didn't get it back because they were wrong. So it kind of, everybody has to be super careful and know exactly you know, what is worth what in each territory, which is why everyone's going crazy now, because nobody knows, if that makes sense. Which kind of goes to the, like, distributor accounting and kind of if you do get money up front and then something later and how that accounting, and there's been a lot of talk about um, maybe not being forthcoming if you get statements. That well, it depends who you sell your movie to. I mean, when I have made a finance to film independently, um, and we, uh, um, and we have, you know, investors, a foreign sales agent, uh, and we all have a certain piece of the pie. We usually hire a separate entity 
There's one in the UK called Fintage. There's one in the States called Lutz and Carr. It doesn't matter. We hire a separate entity. The money all goes to them, and they disperse it. So it has, you know, so there's no, it's not like coming to me and me going, well, I think I'll deduct my taxi to the airport to come to Citizen Jane because I really did talk about the movie, you know, none of that. So then it's just all above board. When a studio makes your movie, and I, I, uh, in one of my books, I think in the second book, I actually published the uh, accounting statement that I got from Fox Searchlight for One Hour Photo. Now, One Hour Photo cost uh, about $14 million to make. It grossed in the US alone about $35 million, and worldwide probably about 70 or 80. And of course, every accounting statement they send me, da -da 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 -da, amount owed to producer, zero. Um, and that's, you know, that's what people are probably complaining about, is that you know, studio accounting is all geared to um, make sure that there aren't any, ever any profits, so that nobody ever gets paid out. So, yeah. So how does that work? You mean so you could be a studio? How does it work when you make a movie? It costs you, like, for instance, if you're on Box Office Mojo, right? And they'll say, well, the movie would cost, I don't know, 80 million to make, and it made back 160 million, but something was about the advertising was not a part of that production budget. Do you have any idea about well, that? Well, I mean, it's a big, that's a big question, but the bottom line is, it's extraordinarily expensive to release a movie these, uh, to release a movie these days. And that's why it's not happening so much anymore with, you know, the movies that go to Sundance. I mean, it used to be, it used to be when you, uh, the kind of movies we made, their theatrical release was really the most amount, the most money they would make. That was more, they'd make more theatrically than they would in the ancillaries in the other, you know, other markets because the other markets weren't that exploitable yet for a, you know, for an art film. So the other thing was movies were review driven so if a movie opened and it got great reviews, it would sit in a theater uh, often for weeks at a time, and it would often do its highest gross, not its first weekend, but its third, fourth, fifth, or sixth weekend after people had had time to, you know, be at a dinner party and say, did you see, you know, did you see Safe yet? Because, boy, is it, that's really something. And that was, you know, how films built. I mean, that was this whole, you know, building an audience. Those were words we used to use, review driven, all of that. And that's all really changed now because a movie's basically made or broken on its first, its theatrical run is made or broken on its first day. Uh, by midday, when I have a movie opening, I get a call in the middle of the afternoon from the distributor who tells me that based on the number of bodies that have already shown up and the number of bodies that have pre-bought tickets for that evening, they can already say this is, what it's, this is the kind of weekend it's going to do and they can pretty much predict the kind of business it's going to do overall, which can, is, is a little depressing in a way because it doesn't let, you know, it, it's like you want like, this idea of like, wow, that movie became a surprise hit. It's like that. It's like that's not so easy anymore, you know. I don't know if you guys remember some movie. There was some movie that um, uh, played in New York at the Paris Theater for a year called "The Gods Must Be Crazy." Yeah. Like that could never happen anymore, you know. Well, it's not us. I mean, because it doesn't pay. It's just that you know. Uh, there's so many movies coming out now. There's so many more movies coming out now. That's part of the issue. And for a long time, and probably still to some degree, still, this is still true to some degree, the having even a brief theatrical run can drive the DVD and the VOD. You know? I mean, if something, so if something had like a, its moment in the theater, that makes the, those other rights more valuable. Then when you get into academy campaigns, then you're just getting into a whole other degree of extreme expense. 
All right, now this was already like 10 years ago, but Boys Don't Cry, made for about 2 million bucks, give or take, sold for 5 million bucks to Fox Searchlight for the world. What do you think 10 years ago they spent to get Hillary Swank that statue? Oh, at least five. Any other guesses? 10. That's what they spent. So that movie really cost Fox Searchlight $15 million for a $2 million movie. Uh, television, um, you know, uh, newspaper ads, uh, these things that I don't know, do you guys, if you guys read the trade magazines, they always have, even though now everyone reads everything online, they still have these sort of like very fancy, uh, you know, ads, but also like inserts that are, will be like, you know, presenting this, you know, spend, yes, all that for your consideration stuff. Uh, parties, you know, they just spend it on how do you keep, how do you keep a movie in people's minds enough so that, you know, um, uh, the, the academy, not only that, not only so the academy will vote on it, but so that it can actually still be in theaters and take advantage of academy attention by the time, um, by the time that rolls around. You know, they, they were maybe going to move the awards, the Academy Awards, to January, which I was really hoping they would do, but now they're saying they're not going to yet. Um, wait, you back there and then you. No, you, yes. <laughs> do you think, because when I teach young people, they seem so unfazed by print and kind of these old-fashioned ways to release things. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wonder, I mean, do you have any prediction in 10, 20 years from now, all this money spent to get it in this traditional way. I just wonder if it just will be lost on your average. Oh, it'll definitely be lost on your average. Make it a more even playing ground I mean, I think that now, though, you have to understand the median age of the academy. Right. Let's yeah, just say like, I bring it down. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the academy still wants to open up its variety in the morning and see a big for your consideration ad for Sandra Bullock from the blind side. I mean, that's what they want. You know, but in a few, but in a few more years, I think it'll. I think you're right. That'll. But then we'll have to figure out other viral ways. I was gonna say, do you have any ideas or? Are you trying no, to I mean, this you know, that, uh, I'm. Look, the academy, the whole academy thing. It's it can be so distracting, and it can be such a you know, it can be such a di it's such a difficult place to throw your hat in, you know, because. Now, do you guys really rethink distribution? Oh, yeah. Oh, for that, absolutely. But that, comes, but that does come down again to this idea. I mean, do you guys, I do believe it comes down to authenticity. Again, like I remember after Blair Witch came out, right? Do you guys remember that? OK. So that was the first movie that, that kind of, that was credited. I don't know if it really was the first movie. It was the first movie credited with really building an internet base that turned it into this like monster hit that people really didn't see coming. You know, that it, so then everyone was like, we're gonna do that too. And of course, it, they couldn't quite, you can't just decide that you're going to start a viral campaign. That's not how these things happen. You know, it has, it has to be something that starts on its own. And I remember at that point, so this was like what, 10, 10 11 years ago, being a, a company, publicity company, pitching to me that the, one of the things that they did was they would send pe their people into chat rooms to chat about your film or your product, you know, and so that you'd be in a, some chat room, you know, of, you know, 17 to 20 year olds and someone, someone would come in and say, hey, you know, I sure can't wait to see the new killer film. <laughs> but People, again, they weren't stupid, and they recognized right away that they were being advertised to, and they didn't like it, you know, because it was inauthentic. It wasn't, you know, that, that, it's, again, that whole notion of, of, you know, what makes this a real experience. So we think about it all the time, but, you know, there's that, you know, Ashton Kutchar has, you know, more Twitter followers than anybody else, but they didn't go see his movie, you know? So, so what does that what does that mean, you know? And I and I know there's a lot of filmmakers and film producers who are like, would you shut up about Twitter already? But the thing is, Twitter has has become a phenomenon, 
that you know obviously is is a way that like you know information information s spreads and trends so and it's, calculable. and it's calculable to some degree but is it actually calculable to to a monetary degree no. yeah and that's really who knows yeah you wonder if there's more of a bad or it'll get overused like i, I think of uh, demi moore right <laughs> And uh, what she's been doing, you know, with Twitter and so forth. And What's she been doing with Twitter? Yeah. Oh, every personal detail of her life. Comes oh, out. that. Well, a lot of people do that. I mean, constant, constant. Right. I think at some point, people are just going to get sick of that. Yeah, but, the, but then there'll be something just like it. I mean, the thing is, is it's like this, the whole notion of us having some kind of social media that keeps us in constant connection, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Foursquare or whatever is the new one, it doesn't really matter what you call it. How do you use that mechanism to, to really to find your audience, locate them, and speak to them directly and say, I made a movie for you. You know, go see it or go download it. You know, that's what we're, that's what we're kind of grappling with. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite part of the production, a producing aspect from you know, getting excited about a script to having Harvey pull you out of the movie. Which is the most exciting and which is the absolutely hardest, worst thing you want have to do in the process? And can you give an example of each in terms of the process? <laughs> God, I feel like this is an essay question. Um, you know, it's... I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's like, I mean, look, the it's all exciting. Finding, you know, getting to to take material uh, and shape it into something that you can, you know, show in any venue is super exciting. And, and watching it come to life. I mean, you know, one of the most exciting moments for me, perhaps, was when I was making a movie called Velvet Goldmine, which was a music film. And uh, the first time we actually played, you know, because up until this point, we'd been shooting a lot of dramatic scenes. And then finally, we were shooting a band called Placebo playing 20th Century Boy. And they were lip syncing to it, but we were playing it on the set. And suddenly, it was like, this is what this movie's about. It's about this kind of music, and that's great. You know, uh, It was maybe the same thing when I saw Kate Planchett play her Bob Dylan character on I'm Not There and realized like, that this was going to be a uncanny performance. Um, you know, when Boys Don't Cry was done and we showed it, literally premiered, no one had seen it before at the Venice Film Festival. And the crowd was like, gave Hillary, who was a nobody, nobody. And she, I mean, she became super polished afterwards. And now, of course, it's like, how could you even imagine her not being well known? But her standing up you know, to, as the whole crowd just kept applauding and applauding and realizing in that moment her life had changed. It was like, it was going to be before and after, you know, and that was, that was amazing. I mean, the hard parts, honestly, it's not production that's hard, it's not getting there that's hard. And that's the hard part, is working really hard to get a movie off the ground and just somehow, some way, it just isn't coming together either the financing or something, you know, or, or, or cast, or somehow, you know, all those elements are just not lining up, and that's incredibly frustrating and awful. We put movies on the shelf. We don't put them away. We put them on the shelf and say, okay, it's not this movie's moment, you know, right? We're not going to get this one made right now. It took us like eight years to get Betty Page made. You know, and in some ways, sometimes what has to happen is the filmmaker has to get more experienced. And, the, and then there's more confidence in his or her ability to pull off the story that, that was deemed too ambitious. So, you know, I don't know. There's, I mean, I honestly, I don't dwell on the hard parts so much because I think it's, you know, uh, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be a film producer, you know, it's, a fa it's fantastic. It's fantastic to be involved in, in the creation of these, pro of these projects. It really is. Yeah. With things like DVR and TiVo, and then also people like cutting back on their expenses because 
because of the economy. Like, I know that I don't have cable anymore. Right. I watch all of my TV online. Right. But I never see film, like, advertisements. I never see trailers when I'm watching my TV shows. It's usually for a sprint or something right, like right. that. Right, right. Why do we not have more trailers on those shows? I honestly, that's not a question I can answer. But, you know, I think it's a good idea. But I think it might have something to do with the fact that there are so many sites specifically for movie trailers. But, you know, um, yeah. I just wondered, when you talked about one hour photo, as a producer, how do you protect yourself from a situation like that? How do you protect yourself so that you do all the work and get paid? You get paid up front. I mean, honestly, it's like that's what studio filmmaking is about. You pretty much know when you're getting into bed with a Fox or a Warner Brothers that you're not, you know, that you're going to make a back end, you know, definition for yourself in your contract. But you know, and they know that it's not, it's not ever going to pay out. So you don't take two dollars up front like you do on a Dirty Girl or a What's Wrong with Virginia. You take a real salary, and then when the movie does well, you're grateful that you're part of something that did well and. You know, and then you think maybe when you're 80, you'll get like some tiny little residual check. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you get that same opportunity when you go to the small screen, like with HBO? Because I mean, that one's more about getting the salary because they're paying you up front. When you make yeah, I mean, we tried with, to a certain degree with HBO to see if we could pull out some because there's a lot of uh, of countries where Todd obviously is is very very well known, and. Um, where that would be interested in showing the five and a half hours theatrically, not for a lot of money, but just as sort of a prestige thing. Like they're showing Carlos. Are you, are you guys following Carlos on IFC? Has anyone started watching it yet? It's really good. But it's like five hours long. And they showed that it can. And IFC bought it and is making it available on demand at the same time as they are uh, showing it theatrically. And on top of that, they're also doing an old-fashioned one episode a night thing. So they're kind of doing a hitting all three ways that you could possibly view it. Do you think that's where it's going, that kind of blitzkrieg approach that mm -hmm. IFC is doing and that I see Magnolia is doing all the time right now? I don't know. You know, it's, I mean, I, it's like we all keep asking ourselves where it is going as if it is one thing. And it's not, you know. I mean, that is, that is where some of the it is going, for sure, you know. Uh, VOD has been very successful for IFC. That's really worked. Um, so they're certainly going to keep doing it. I mean, um, you know, it was very successful for us with Cairo Time, which has just passed, you know, one and a half million dollars in theatrical gross, which these days is pretty damn good, you know. Um, and the VOD numbers will bring that, you know, close to two, two and a half million dollars. So that's a success story. Um, but, you know, I just think there's a whole lot of different it's. Yeah. How do you, uh, when I look at older films, more recent, they all have this really artist-director driven um, drive that you must protect, I think, with all these students and stuff. But how do, are you finding talent now? Because you've been in the business so long. I'm sure people would love to find you, but then you can only work with so many people. How do you best, what makes you choose to do a project? And how do you, like hire a time, how did that come about? Well, Cairo Time came about because uh, Ruba was mentored by Adam McGoyan. And Adam McGoyan called me and asked me if I would take a look at, at her script. And the movie was virtually already financed with money out of Canada, another subsidized film culture. And, um, but Ruba, because she was a, a, a first timer, she needed some help getting the agencies to pay attention to her. So what I did was I called CAA. I said, I got a great part here for a woman who doesn't have to be 25. And um, uh, they got it to Patty Clarkson, who I already had a relationship with. And that's how it all happened. But if you're asking how do you, how do I find talent? I mean, I have people that work for me whose job it is to you know, keep an eye out, go to film festivals, look at films, uh, you know, talk. I mean, I don't take unsolicited manuscripts anymore. I just can't. If I did, I'd be, I'd be overwhelmed. And the fact, the sad fact of the matter is, is most scripts are terrible. And 
they're so terrible, I know none of yours are, but they're so terrible that I will do anything not to read one. I really will. I will, like, that's when I get, you know, the way to get me to clean my house is to put a pile of scripts on the table. And then I'm like, oh, okay, you know, got to do laundry. Um, and so it really can be exhausting, you know, slogging through, you know, eh, script after eh, script, and thinking, like, you know, this is what somebody's so passionate about. But look, I, it doesn't mean I'm the arbiter of, you know, it's just my opinion. But it is, you know, most scripts are really not great. So <clears throat> we, we do, you know, when I look at a script, I'm looking for a couple different things. First of all, we're very director driven. So I have a tendency to want to have a sense of who the director is. And is he or she somebody I feel I can work with? How do I make that judgment? Are they somebody who is articulate? Or can they articulate their vision effectively? I don't mean they have to be a chatterbox. I mean, can they tell me uh, and, and communicate to their crew, presumably, as well, what kind of vision they want and how they, what they want to see up there? Um, we keep trying to figure out what's a test to determine whether or not a director is you know, a nut job because we have gotten ourselves into some bad situations, not for a while, but, you know, it's really like, it's like you're getting in, into bed with a crazy director. It's like literally you're out in the middle of the ocean and the captain turns to you and says, oh, by the way, I don't know how to, I don't know how to drive this boat and a storm's coming. That's what it's like. So uh, the only test that we could come up with is, does he or she have a relationship with another living thing? Uh, could be a significant other, could be a pet, a plant, but has he or she managed to sustain a relationship over a period of time with something else alive? And that, that has so far worked for us to some degree. Um, because, you know, so a director for us is very critical. That's not true for every single company. Um, I mean, that does, you know, and then the script is also very, very critical. And, you know, the old adage, like, you can't make a good movie out of a bad script. You really can't. You can, sadly, make a bad movie out of a good script, but that's another story. Um, but you really can't. You can't save it somehow in, in the edit room, or at least I have not ever been able to. And usually if there's something that's not working there, if you have a misgiving about it, then you have to address it at the script level. Um, so I take the combination of the director and the script, and then I have to see, is this something that I think is original? Do I think it's a story that, that needs to be told? That doesn't mean that it has to have a social agenda. It, I mean more, is there a lack? Is there like not another story that is, that, you know, is resonating in the same way this is? Um, I have to think, is there something about it I can sell? Does it have a great part, like Boys Don't Cry? What was really clear was, OK, this movie is a Debbie Downer. <laughs> but that part is gonna, could be like the part of a lifetime. And that is what is going to make it transcend the fact that no matter how we cut it, she dies at the end. I mean, that's the, you know. And we tried to put a positive spin on it at the end. But I don't think many people, I think most people came out and were like, yeah, well, you know, thanks a lot. I'm going to go, you know, sit in a dark room now. Um, so, so that's one thing we look for. You know, is it, you know, is it a, gr a great part? Uh, is there something about some hook, some obvious hook to an audience that, that I can, that will help me market it, sell it, convince a, a potential financier to put money into it? With I'm not there. Obviously, that was Bob Dylan, like his, his you know, myriad le legions of fans all across the globe was a big part of that. And then the musical element, the fact that we w wanted to do something that wasn't simply reissues of his music, but that where we had new bands covering um, you know, his classics, et cetera, gave the, um, the distributor more elements to, to exploit and to use in the sale of it. We didn't work with Bob Dylan. Oh, I thought you did. 
No, we made a movie called I'm Not There that used a lot of Dylan's music. What? Well, he sold us his rights, so I guess he, I guess he was approving it, but we did not work with Bob Dylan. So we worked with his business manager. Um, and nobody in the movie is named Bob or Dylan. So, yeah. What is the best movie you've produced that we haven't seen? Like, what's the movie you've made that you're bummed out that more people didn't take to? And Any movie I've made that people didn't take to, I'm bummed out. But, you know, um, I'll tell you uh, two. One is I Shot Andy Warhol is a fantastic movie that was uh, financed at the time by... Uh, American Playhouse and the Samuel Goldwyn Company. And then the Samuel Goldwyn Company went under and their library was bought by a company called uh, Orion that was owned by MGM. <laughs> you following me here? So it was kind of an orphan. However, Orion had a young guy who worked for them who really loved the movie and he and I became very good friends. And that guy was Bob Burney. Do you guys know who he is? He's sort of a legendary distributor. So Bob Burney released the movie as best as he could, uh, and, um, but there just wasn't that much. He just didn't have that many resources, sadly. Um, and uh, uh, so I always felt like that film didn't quite get its due. And the other one is a movie that Rose Trochet made for us called The Safety of Objects. Um, which had, you know, was premiering at the Toronto Film Festival on September 9th, um, you know, uh, to, uh, right. And um, in that whole insanity, the movie just, like, it just never found its footing again. If you can rent it, it's really good. It's got some great performances from Patty Clarkson, um, uh, Timothy Oliphant, Glenn Close, and it's Kristen Stewart's first movie. Um, so uh, I, I always forget about that. So anyway, that's, those are two just off the top of my head. But if I looked at a whole roster, you know, if I looked at all of them, I could just, you know, I mean, uh, another movie that really has achieved cult classic status, but I thought more people would see when it came out was Camp. Um, you know, which is a movie I really love. Um, you know, pretty much all of them. Channel 